semester of doing this. It just seems uh, yesterday that uh, we were meeting over at Arnita's old shop, AJ, and uh, 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 brainstorming uh, how to put this in place. And here it's two years later uh, and going great. Um, looking at the, um, the response we're getting on, an, um, uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, let me not be remiss, as always, to acknowledge the support of the Society of Historians of American Foreign Relations for um, supporting uh, this effort, um, which is, of course, jointly co-sponsored by the National History Center that Roger directs an initiative of the American Historical Association. And also let me uh, acknowledge, as always, the Real heavy lifting for much of this is done by Marion Barber and uh, my team. Uh, uh, today it's Hannah uh, Morris and Pete Bierstecker, um, who uh, Allison is, um, is out for the week, who uh, do much of the legwork for this, um, this event. Next week we have Stephen Weissman on the Lamamba assassination and CIA accountability. Um, this week we have uh, the great um, pleasure of welcoming, welcoming to the center Professor Dane Kennedy with uh, a talk on reassessing exploration, the West in the world. He is the Elmer Lewis Kaiser Professor of History and International <coughs> Affairs at George Washington University, where he teaches courses on world history, the British Empire, Europe, and the world. He was a recipient of a John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship in 2003-2004. He's written a good number of books uh, on the British imperial experience. His, the most recent of these um, include, uh, the most recent of this is The Highly Civilized Man, Richard Burton and the Victorian World, published in 2005. He currently has two books in press, The Challenge of Its Continents, The British Exploration of Africa and Australia uh, with Harvard University Press, and an edited volume on the history of exploration with Oxford University Press. Uh, Professor Kennedy received his master's and PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. And again, it's a privilege and pleasure to welcome him uh, to the Wilson Center and to this event. And with that, let me turn it over to Roger. Well, in saying a word of welcome uh, to Dane Kennedy, uh, I would like to point out that Dane is a member of the team that uh, conducts the decolonization seminar in the summer. And so Dane is not only a historian of modern Europe, he is also an authority on the decline and collapse of the European colonial empires and the post-colonial uh, experience. The other point that I would like to make about Dane is that when he was writing uh, his works on exploration, a lot of this took place while he was teaching at the University of Nebraska. Now this gives you a very interesting geographical vantage point. If you consider Nebraska to be the center of the world, the center of the universe, then you can trace all of these explorations, whether they're Chinese or Portuguese and so on, in relation to when they actually reached Nebraska. Now this gives you an entirely different uh, and interesting uh, perspective. Uh, we do have a ritual in which we ask people very briefly to identify themselves. Uh, last time I, asked, I, I said that if you wish, you could also add how you justify your exi existence and no one took me up on that. Uh, they simply identified themselves, so I guess this may be a preference. Shall we start with Marion, or? This is the problem. When I'm not around, then you get all sorts of additional taskers, so <laughs> Marion. I'm Marion Barber, the Associate Director of the National History Center. Hi, I'm Roger Lanius from the National Air and Space Museum here at the Smithsonian. I'm Richard Price from the University of Maryland. Stephen Shore, I work for the PBGC. Uh, Gerald Smith, University of Arizona, specialist in Middle East history. Sharon Harley, University of Maryland. Landis Jones, uh, emeritus uh, professor at University of Louisville. Robert Baum, an African historian and uh, uh, Wilson fellow. Charles Warner, uh, 
intern from Wilson Center with Dr. Rochelle Davis and Chuck and Jerry Warner with the Air Force Research Labs. Uh, Chachin, Bethesda, Maryland. Mike Steinman, retired political scientist. Linda Steinman, friend of Danes from the University of Nebraska. <laughs> Don Wolfensberger with the Congress programs here at the Wilson Center. Robert Donnelly, Woodrow Wilson Center. Judith Plotz, friend and colleague of Danes at uh, George Washington University and fellow member of the late lamented uh, colonization, uh, colonial seminar, which failed, perhaps properly. <laughs> Uh, Roy Matthews, a retired professor, Michigan State University, British History. Uh, I'm Kenton Clymer. I'm a Wilson Fellow, and I do History of American Relations with South and Southeast Asia, which has something to do with decolonization. I'm Al Schmidt. I'm a longtime retired professor in history and for over 60 years a life member of the AHA. Hmm. Julia Clancy Smith. I'm a Wilson Fellow and an historian of Middle East, North Africa. Um, I'm Muhmante. I'm from Mongolia, currently interning in D.C. Uh, Linda Moorfield, Senior Review Editor of the Washington Independent Review of Books, um, from which I've learned a lot about um, Dane's work. <laughs> I'm Lisa Jones, uh, Historian Emerita from the H.A. I'm Theo Christoph, uh, Teaching in Intellectual History at G uh, George Washington University. I'm Clara Kemmer, junior scholar here at the Woodrow Wilson Center and doing a PhD on colonial history. And I'm Christine Kelly. I'm an intern at the National History Center. I'm Pilar Siti Sudhir of the American Historical Association. Angela Santesa, Yara de Santo. Michele Scianto, PhD candidate at the University of Bologna. I'm uh, Peter Beersaker. I'm on the staff of the History and Public Policy Program here at the Center. Marco Boggero, I'm a PhD student at SAIS. James Sang, physicist retired. Luis Passera, Wilson Center Fellow. Lorna Grenadier, National Portrait Gallery docent. Hannah, introduce yourself too. Hi, I'm Hannah, I'm an intern here at the Wilson Center. <coughs> Pat? Dane Kennedy on reassessing exploration. Well, I, first of all, I, I, I want to thank Christian and, and Roger for, for inviting me to this seminar and uh, all of you for attending. I, I see so many uh, old friends as, as well. It's really a, a thrill. And, and it's a particular thrill to be uh, speaking at this seminar, which, which has really established itself as, as, as a, a, an important venue for, for uh, contemporary work in, in historical research and, and a way of sort of extending uh, dialogues among historians to, to a larger larger audience. And uh, so I've attended a number of these seminars and always found them fascinating. I'm very grateful for all of you for coming here today. Um, as, as Christian said, I, I'm, I've got two books that are currently in press. Uh, one is a sort of a more narrowly uh, uh, focused uh, monographic study of British, well, not that narrow, uh, British exploration in Africa and Australia over the course of a century. So, so it's, it's fairly broad in some sense. Uh, and then I've also uh, got a, a, a volume of, of essays, various contributors uh, looking at exploration in a variety of different contexts, and I've, I've uh, written the introduction for that. And it's forced me to sort of think more broadly about exploration and its, and its relevance to, to a number of other issues of, uh, connected with the, really, in effect, the birth of the modern world. Now, I have to say that, that uh, earlier in my career as a historian of the British Empire, I would never have contemplated uh, doing research work on, on exploration. Like many professional historians, I tended to view the subject as, as, as a tired and overworked one. Um, and it seemed really too closely tied uh, to a triumphalist view of, of the West. Uh, too much of it consisted of these uh, sort of uh, hagiographic biographies of various explorers and the like. That changed to some degree when I, I started to work on, on my last book, a, a kind of intellectual biography of Richard Burton. Uh, but when I started that project, I, I was sort of determined in an odd, oddly counterintuitive way to, to sort of not give uh, 
or to downplay basically his, his, his role as an explorer, which really had been central to, to many of the biographies that have been done uh, about this man. Now, much to my surprise, perhaps not anyone else's, I, I found that exploration was a far more uh, interesting and important subject than I had appreciated when I started that project. And reinforcing my sense that this was a subject worth attention was the discovery uh, in the course of doing that research and then subsequently uh, that there was a lot of really important work being done by scholars in other disciplines on exploration, by uh, people in literary studies, by historical geographers, by historians of science in, in particular. And all of this sort of drew me inevitably into the set of projects that I'm currently uh, completing and led me to a, a, a reassessment of, of exploration's role in, in the history of the modern world. And, and, and let me throw out sort of a, a, a basic, very broad proposition to start this out with. And, and that is that I think in some ways exploration can be seen as a central and perhaps defining feature of the West's encounters uh, with other peoples and lands. It is central in a variety of ways. First of all, it laid the groundwork, I think, for imperial expansion. It set in motion uh, the great engine of globalization. And it helped to give rise to a whole array of modern epistemologies, identities, and ideas of difference. I realize these are pretty bold claims, and I doubt that I can really fully substantiate them uh, in the talk today, but I at least want to touch on some of the reasons uh, why exploration has attracted renewed attention from a variety of, of scholars and why it obviously has attracted my attention as well. So let me begin by observing that, that exploration has at least, I think, two distinct associations. One is mythic and universal, I'd say, and the other is modern and the product of a particular historical heritage. I'm not too concerned about the first association in today's talk, although it certainly needs to be acknowledged, so let me just say this about it. Exploration is a subject that really taps into one of the great mythic themes of human experience, venturing into the unknown and testing the limits of one's endurance and courage as a means of self-discovery. Uh, there are those who, in fact, regard exploration as an innate human instinct, an impulse that separates, it, separates us from, from other species. Uh, the evolutionary geneticist uh, Svante Pablo, Pablo for example, has speculated that the exploration thing, as he puts it, may be hardwired in our genetic code. Now, this is a claim I'm in no position to evaluate, but I would simply observe that exploration as uh, an epic quest that leads to some form of enlightenment or discovery is really integral to many cultures and certainly evident in our own classical heritage, uh, the adventures of Odysseus, for example. Now, much of the appeal of exploration, both to those who engaged in it and those who read about it, uh, derives from what it reveals about an individual's character when faced with a strange, often harsh environment that threatens their survival. So as a result, uh, even though exploration in the classic sense of opening up new lands has arguably largely come to an end, uh, it lives on in other forms, I think, in modern culture, in things like mountaineering and extreme sports and various other enterprises that test the will and limits of endurance. Now, as a historian, however, I'm less interested in sort of the psychological and perhaps spiritual dimensions of exploration than I am in its historical uh, contexts and consequences. There's been a recent work that's tried to address this in very broad terms. This is uh, Philippe Fernandez Armesto's uh, Pathfinders, a global history of exploration. And he effectively argues that exploration is coterminous with human history itself, an assertion that on the surface seems similar to Pabo's uh, claim. But Fernandez Armesto historicizes his argument by describing exploration as a process by which peoples dispersed across the globe over many many thousands of years ago, and then reconverged in recent centuries. Now, one of the purposes for this sort of very broad kind of argument uh, is clearly to escape a Eurocentric uh, 
frame of reference, a kind of reference within which exploration is normally addressed, considered. A similar agenda has informed the works of a number of other historians. There's been work, for example, on in the past couple of decades on, on the Polynesians' uh, remarkable voyages of colonization to islands across the South uh, Pacific, uh, to the fleets that, that Ming China uh, sent across the Indian Ocean and elsewhere under the command of Admiral Zenghi, uh, to the wide-ranging travels of Ibn Battuta and uh, other Arabs to the Ottoman Empire's uh, projection of power into the Red Sea and, and the Persian Gulf, and other cases of what can certainly be considered uh, non-Western exploration. Now, I'm certainly sympathetic to these efforts to broaden our understanding of exploration as a historical experience, a historical enterprise, but I think we also really can't deny or ignore its special associations with a European heritage. Uh, these associations are important both in terms of the way exploration is construed as a distinctive enterprise with its own protocols and practices, and the way it was actually carried out by European states and their agents to advance their interests around the globe. On the first point, it's worth noting uh, that we first see the word exploration come into common usage in the English language to refer to arduous journeys uh, abroad uh, in the mid to late 18th century. The word explorer is coined in the early 19th century. Now words have histories and those histories harbor larger contexts. And in this case, the unprecedented efforts by the British and I should say other European states as well uh, for whom uh, the, some very close, uh, nearly identical form of this Latin-derived uh, uh, word uh, comes into widespread use as well. Um, their efforts to, to probe the distant re reaches of the globe for the purposes of trade, conquest, and colonization provide the backdrop, obviously, for explorations, associations with adventures in distant, distant lands. Exploration came to be seen as the harbinger of Europe's triumphal entry onto the world stage. Each of the states that were involved in this enterprise have had their own explorers to honor and celebrate. Uh, the posthumous apotheosis of Christopher Columbus by Spain, uh, Vasco da Gama by Portugal, uh, Francis Drake by England, and a, a, a whole series of other early explorer adventurers established a pattern that would persist into the 20th century. And we can all, I think, recite a long list of explorers, Bering, Cook, Lewis and Clark, Livingston, Amundsen, and others, who have assumed iconic importance as emblems of state power and national prestige. Exploration and explorers also be became bound up with European notions of the modern which I think really came into play during the Enlightenment of the 18th century. Expeditions of discovery came to be viewed by Europeans and their colonial cousins as missions in the service of modernity. Several factors made them modern, I'd argue. They employed naval and military technologies that made it possible for them to circumnavigate the globe, uh, to probe the remotest regions of the world, and to exert their will over many uh, of the peoples they met along the way. They used compasses, sextants, chronometers, and other scientific instruments to map their routes and locations, establishing geographical coordinates to guide those who follow them. They collected plants, animals, and mineral specimens, meteorological, magnetic, and astronomical data, ethnographic artifacts and linguistic information, establishing museums and other uh, archives where this material was classified, categorized, and made useful. All of these activities and accomplishments contributed to Europeans' growing conviction that they embodied and advanced the forces of modernity. And in particular, with the great 18th century voyages of discovery did by de Bougainville of, of, of France, uh, Cook of Britain, uh, uh, Malaspina of Spain and others. Scientific exploration became firmly fixed in the European cultural imagination as a key measure of modernity. 
Henceforth, I think, exploration would connote a combination of scientific and technological achievement, state power, and national prestige, connotations that in many respects have endured to the present day, perhaps most notably in space exploration, although if any of you saw uh, 60 Minutes last night, uh, there's this sense of, of, of deflation among many of those who are involved in, in, in that uh, enterprise uh, uh, now that it's uh, largely come to an end. These connotations also have come to differentiate, and, that, and this is an important point, I think, have come to differentiate exploration from other forms of travel, such as those motivated by trade, tourism, and migration. Now, it may be anachronistic to regard Columbus and other vanguards of European overseas expansion as engaged in exploration as a specialized scientific, in, in the specialized scientific sense that it subsequently acquired. Uh, but the tag has stuck because it served a larger purpose, to establish a genealogy of exploration uh, that reinforced a sense of, of European exceptionalism. Exploration became a triumphalist symbol of the energy, enterprise, and inventiveness of Europeans and their overseas offspring, and was used as a key marker of difference between their own societies and those found elsewhere in the world. Which brings us, I think, to one of the main sources, a, a, main, a major impetus uh, for the renewed attention that scholars have recently given to the idea and practice of exploration, is to examine, to explain, to critique the role of the West in the world, which is the subtitle of my talk today. And this agenda has taken several forms. One has been to expose the ideological foundations of Western expansion and examine its epistemological premises. The growing influence of post-colonial studies uh, within, um, among literary scholars, uh, cultural historians, and other people in humanities disciplines has certainly helped to shape this agenda. So has the, uh, what we might describe as a kind of self-reflexive turn that has occurred among geographers, historians of science, and some other social scientists, anthropologists, for example, who've been spur spurred to really sort of critically assess their own discipline's origins and to acknowledge the role that, that, that exploration contributed to the development of their disciplinary practices and institutions. A second objective has been to demonstrate that the experiences of exp explorers in the field were often at variance with the ways those experiences were portrayed for public consumption. Area study specialists have made especially helpful contributions, I think, demonstrating that the operations and outcomes of many expeditions were shaped in crucial ways by local peoples and polities. Explorers often relied heavily on indigenous intermediaries for intelligence, for logistics, to negotiate with local rulers, to translate, uh, any number of other activities. Recent research has given new insights into the uh, encounters and engagements that actually took place during and after expeditions between explorers and the native peoples then with whom they came in contact, between explorers and the natural environments with which they saw, uh, within which they struggled to survive, and between explorers and the domestic institutions and publics from which they sought validation and reward. And put this in more abstract terms, I think much of the recent scholarship on exploration can be characterized as concerned with the mediation between expectation and experience, between observation and understanding, between representation and reality. Now much of what we know about journeys to distant lands comes from the first-hand accounts of those who made them. Uh, Marco Polo's travels her, helped establish the European genre of travel writing. Its readers included Christopher Columbus, who made marginal comments in his copy of, of, of Polo's uh, travel before he set out across the Atlantic to the Americas, where, of course, he recorded his own observations about the strange places and peoples that he came in contact with. By the end of the 16th century, Richard Hacklett had compiled enough English travel accounts of faraway places to fill three fat volumes of the principal navigations, voyages, and tra traffics and discoveries of the English na nation, which is the title of, of this work published between 
1598 and 1600. Soon thereafter, Francis Bacon advised travelers in his essay on travel to keep a daily record of their observations in a diary or journal. Now, this was already a common practice, he noted, among sea captains. Um, but he urged other travelers to do the same. Again, another form of recording, of writing. With the dramatic expansion of print culture in 18th century Europe, the demand for travel literature grew, grew apace. The result was that books like Bougainville's and Cook's accounts of their travels became bestsellers, as did travel satires like Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels and Voltaire's Candide. Explorers and other travelers soon came to recognize that they could profit, gain profit and acclaim by writing books about their journeys. By the early 19th century, uh, the British uh, London publisher, uh, John Murray, was specializing in travel accounts and published literally thousands of books that were devoted simply to, to journeys to other parts of the, of, the, of the world. Now, the rise of the new journalism in the late 19th century created a further source of synergy between print culture and exploration. Men like uh, Henry Morton Stanley and, and Pierre de Braza wrote sensationalist accounts of their exploits in, as they called them, savage lands. Uh, initially as reports to newspapers, uh, then as big blockbuster best-selling books. Right? So my larger point here is, is that exploration as it is commonly understood in European culture or Western culture more generally is in a, inextricably associated with writing, with publishing, and with greeting. Now, explorers were, of course, writing about their own observations and experiences, which gave their chronicles a subjective autobiographical character. Even when they were describing the environments they encountered or the peoples they encountered, their accounts reflected their personal sensibilities, preferences, prejudices, desires, fears. It was their adventures and ordeals that drove these narratives. And so it's not surprising, for example, that, that biography remains probably sort of the standard way in which uh, exploration is usually uh, uh, recounted today. And invariably, they cast themselves as the heroes of their own tales, and uh, there was a collusion between them and the press and the public to do so. Not surprisingly, then, it's literary scholars who first began to focus attention on the culturally constructed nature of these travel narratives. Uh, Edward Said got the ball rolling with his now infamous, or depending on your point of view, uh, famous, I meant famous, or depending on your point of view, infamous, I think it's a remarkable book, um, Orientalism. Uh, and he helped to inspire uh, students of literature to turn their attention to travel writing, uh, which has subsequently become the subject of a vigorous scholarly industry. There are just tons of books out there now by literary scholars on travel. Now, critics have rightly complained that much of this scholarship is marred uh, by its reliance on a limited body of evidence, mainly history critics, of course, right? <laughs> and by sometimes uh, simplistic assertions about European imperialism and, and racism. It should also be said that literary scholars have, for the most part, I think, failed to distinguish between exploration narratives and other kinds of travel narratives, or rather between exploration and travel as forms of, 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 of movement uh, to, to strange places. And in so doing, I think they've occluded the ways exploration differed, for example, from, from tourism and, and the like. Even so, literary scholars have opened up, I think, several important lines of inquiry. One concerns the ways in which explorers' original field notes and journals were transform, transformed into published texts that conform to epistola, epistolary conventions. It's become increasingly, a clear, increasingly clear that what explorers wrote in the field often went through multiple revisions before it appeared in print, a process that substantially altered the texts and eroded their authenticity as, as, as records of immediate observations and experiences. The controversy, a classic case of this, the controversy caused by John Hawksworth's uh, editorial emendations of Captain Cook's journal for the Admiralty Commission book about the South Sea expeditions uh, called a, an account of the voyages undertaken by making discoveries in the Southern Hemispheres. 
1773. Um, this, this caused a, a big stir when it first appeared because it was clear that Hawksworth had actually sort of modified language, had, had restructured defense and, and, and the like. But he wasn't unusual. In fact, most explorers' original texts were modified, whether by friends or officials or editors or publishers or others. And the intent of these editorial interventions was to make narratives obviously more palatable for public consumption. So how these works were marketed and consumed then be, has become a major preoccupation of a lot of recent work on, on the subject of exploration. And it's told us, I think, a great deal about the meanings and uses that domestic audiences drew from exploration. Publishers and their publics were part of a much larger network of domestic institutions and interest groups that gave European exploration much of its shape and purpose. And these entities included um, uh, various branches of government, uh, you know, the armies, navies, colonial services, and the like. It included geographical societies, uh, museums and botanical gardens, missionary organizations, merchant associations, and more. As these organizations' diverse range of interests and exploration has become better understood, it's become more difficult, I think, to identify a single and direct line of causation that connects exploration to empire. Expeditions were sponsored by a variety of groups for a variety of purposes. Those purposes certainly overlapped in many instances because they certainly shared uh, an interest in acquiring uh, knowledge of and access to the wider world. But they also collided with one another. While exploration can be said, I think, to have been the avatar of European empires, a lot of recent research, I think, has come to show that these empires were shaped by, uh, oh, excuse me, that those empires, yes, were shaped by a range of interest groups with multiple, often contending objectives. Now, one element within Western society that played a particularly important role in shaping exploration as a distinct enterprise was the scientific community, which gave it a, a distinctive set of protocols and practices from the 18th century onward. And recent work by historians of science and technology have, I think, shown that, that scientific disciplines like botany, zoology, and geography did not assume their modern forms merely by means of laboratory experiments or flashes of insight and the comforts of, 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 of studies, that they derived and in very important ways through observations and experiences in the field, and especially observations carried out by men who were specially trained uh, to make use of, of scientific instruments and the like. So the relationship between exploration and science really reached, I think, it, 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 its full flower with the Enlightenment in the 18th century, which laid many of the enduring intellectual and institutional bonds between these two enterprises. Among its characteristics was this emphasis upon collecting, classifying, and categorizing botanical and ethnographic and other specimens. The use of instruments to survey cartographic space and measure meteorological and natural phenomena. Exploration, in other words, was important to the development of a variety of, 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 of natural, uh, excuse me, a variety of scientific disciplines. If you look at many of, for example, the, the great 19th century British scientists, Charles Darwin, uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, Thomas Huxley, Joseph Hooker, all of them, all of them got their starts, their professional starts, as naturalists on expeditions in foreign lands, in distant lands. Exploration appealed as much, of course, to emotion as it did to reason. Exploration narratives were popular with readers, literary critics have shown, because they produced a sense of physical danger, because they also generated this fantasy of, of erotic freedom or various other kinds of thrills. They're clearly, it's an emotional charge that arises from accounts of expeditions in strange and distant and exotic lands. And explorers themselves were certainly not immune to those, those thrills. It was an integral part of what actually drew them into these, these often very dangerous enterprises. Let me give you a few examples. Uh, Joseph Banks was the great impresario of British exploration in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Was both 
the sober collector of botanical specimens uh, and coordinator of, of scientific enterprises, and the rakish aficionado of native women during, during a South Sea voyage uh, with Captain Cook. Uh, Alexander von Humboldt, the famed exemplar of the scientific explorer, was both the rigorous advocate of scientific rationalism and the romantic celebrant of natural wonder during his five long year journey through Latin America. German and Belgian explorers of Africa in the late 19th century were on the one hand proponents of self-control and sober judgment, and they were also often, as the African anthropologist Johann Fabian has, has, has argued, they were often out of their minds. <laughs> out of their minds from fever, from fatigue, from fear, and from the various drugs that they used to try to sort of overcome uh, these, these, these challenges, the opiates and the alcohol and the like, uh, leading to what uh, Fabian actually argues was a state of ecstasis among many of these guys. Now, Fabian's study is a wonderful book, and it's titled Out of, Out of Our Minds, or Out of Their Minds, um, points to another important concern of recent scholarship on exploration. The quotidian experiences of explorers in the field, and especially the cultural encounters with indigenous peoples. And these first contacts, as they often were, one of the central themes, I think, of the new historiography of exploration. And their importance derives, above all, from the way they open up alternative narrative perspectives, offering a means of overcoming a kind of Western-centered focus that uh, is characteristic of much of the earlier scholarship on exploration. Uh, African historians, uh, Pacific studies specialists, and various other area studies scholars have been especially assiduous in pursuing indigenous perspectives on these encounters. Even though the archives have often left us with, with few traces or direct traces of the voices of the peoples who came in contact with explorers. Um, a lot of resourceful work has been done by anthropologists, historians, and, and, and others to find new ways to gaining insight into the experiences and intentions of these people. And what this work has made clear, I think, is that local inhabitants often held the upper hand in encounters with the Europeans who passed through their territories. Although explorers rarely acknowledge their dependence upon native peoples and the published accounts of their expeditions. And in fact, this is one of the, I think one of the key ways in which what gets represented in print and what occurred on the ground are often really starkly different, different uh, uh, phenomena. Um, if you read unpublished, their unpublished journals and, and, and letters and the like, you, you, you see that the frequency with which they give vent to their frustration at their helplessness, at their bewilderment, at their, their sense that, that they're simply not in control of these, of these, these enterprises. Uh, European explorations in East Africa, for example, expeditions in East Africa, relied on pre-existing trade routes, pre-existing labor practices, pre-existing political systems, pre a whole array of other pre-existing institutional structures to actually make their way into the interior and go from place to place, actually determine the routes they took. It determines sort of the, the, the manner in which they traveled from, from place to place. The same could be said about other expeditions across Africa and in other parts of the world where there were large populations. The crucial contribution, moreover, that indigenous guides, translators, and other intermediaries made to expeditions is another aspect of exploration as cultural encounter uh, that has begun to receive, uh, I think, the attention that it deserves. Although explorers often praised their native assistants, they usually cast these individuals in the conventional role of loyal servants, dutifully carrying out the um, the wishes of their masters. In truth, most of these so-called assistants were quasi-independent contractors with wills and agendas of their own. Uh, it's, it's remarkable how, and, and how, how the explorers and these, these intermediaries interact with one another 
on a level in many cases of, of, of sort of equality during, during these expeditions or even more than that. I, give you one example here. The African explorer uh, Joseph Thompson, uh, on his first expedition through East Africa, privately, privately, not publicly, uh, credited his caravan's headmen, as they were called, with, and this is a, a quote, the success of the expedition. And he gratefully confessed that they were, quote, imbued with the idea that I was specially under their care, to be taken carefully and safely round and shown the sights in Africa. Right? A great deal of insight, I think, in that, in, in that, that comment. Uh, now, some of these so-called indigenous intermediaries became independent explorers in their own right. Uh, perhaps the most famous example are the uh, Indian pundits who the British recruited to explore Central Asia. Um, and their very existence, to some degree, began to destabilize the category of explorer, who was an explorer, right? Uh, and was it truly and in, 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 in inevitably a European enterprise? Now, although the autonomous journeys carried out by the pundits was unusual, we know that the indigenous go-betweens who took part in European expeditions often enjoyed far greater independence and exerted far more influence on expeditions than previously recognized or acknowledged. So a final theme, a final theme that I think has attracted considerable attention in recent years is the relationship between explorers and the natural environment, and not just in scientific terms, but in other ways as well. Many scholars have taken their cue from the Australian art historian Bernard Smith, whose path-breaking book, European Vision in the South Pacific, showed that the artists who accompanied Cook and other explorers in the South Pacific were obliged to break with artistic conventions in order to represent the unfamiliar environments and peoples that they encountered. And Smith has inspired, I think, a, a growing body of work on explorers' representations of the territories they pass through and the agendas that inform those representations. Now, sometimes, admittedly, explorers drew on domestic aesthetic aesthetic categories, like the picturesque and the sublime, to portray the lands that they encountered. But more often than not, they stressed the very alterity, uh, the strangeness of these places. Striking examples include the characterization of many uh, places like, like Central America and India as torrid, are tropical zones that pose special risks to Europeans. Or even a more distancing uh, trope was the representation of Africa as the dark continent. But perhaps the most original and intriguing line of inquiry has focused on explorations, contributions to the rise, actually, of a modern environmentalist consciousness. Recently, for example, Aaron Sachs has argued that Alexander von Humboldt's influence it, it, that he influenced, that his influence, excuse me, on explorers of the American West laid the foundations for a conservationist tradition in the United States. Others have shown that explorers' discoveries of buried cities in Central Asia, uh, the jungle entangled pyramids of, of the Yucatan Peninsula, and the other lost societies and civilizations ranging from you know, Easter Island to Mesopotamia, ancient Mesopotamia help to heighten an appreciation of the impact that climate change has had on human societies in the past, as well as the impact that human societies has, have had on natural environments. So I think we can no longer view exploration in the celebratory terms that seem to prevail in the past, rather than rehearsing the tired uh, old themes of exploration as the expression of individual heroism and national prestige, Historians and other scholars have instead, I think, pursued new themes that address, first, its ideological contribution to a Western sense of exceptionalism, that is sort of deconstructing and critiquing that, that sense of exceptionalism, and its experiential contribution to the cultural engagement between different types of peoples of different cultures. Although exploration as a distinct practice with its own procedures and protocols was for the most part a 
Western-driven enterprise, I would argue, it was also aided, altered, and remade by the non-Western peoples whose lands it sought to investigate. So let me conclude by pointing to the ways then this renewed academic interest in the story of exploration I think is connected to several broader intellectual agendas. One is the endeavor to expose the ideological and epistemological foundations of the imperial project itself and to challenge any lingering influences it may have on our mental map of the world. Another is the desire to trace the sources and identify the patterns of cultural encounters and exchanges, which has become such a prominent feature of what we now call globalization. A third is a better way, is, is to better understand our planet's complex climate and ecosystem using that knowledge to caution us about the destructive effects of our insatiable demand for resources. All of these agendas speak to issues that are in certain respects traceable to exploration as a primary point of inquiry. The ideas and practices of modern European empires arose out of the initial expeditions to discover new land. The primal scene of cultural encounter and exchange was that first contact between explorer and native. And the scientific investigation and economic exploitation of the natural world was integral, obviously, to the enterprise of exploration. As historians and others work to craft integrated narratives of our intersecting pasts as a human community, it's hardly surprising, I think, that they have rediscovered the theme of exploration. This may be a self-rationalization, of course. Um, since it serves as such a ready avenue of access to so many of the central concerns that we confront today. So, thank you. Uh, Dane, out of the many topics that you have discussed, I have always thought that your study of the uh, literary uh, scholarship uh, on these historical subject of exploration has been especially interesting because Dane, perhaps more than any, any other of the historians, has managed to make sense out of what to many of us remains the mysteries of the English uh, departments. Now, in one way <laughs> or another, uh, I think this probably is a question related to uh, Edward Said, but even so Edward Said is now sufficiently distant that we can get a historical uh, assessment of the way in which he is, uh, has an enduring uh, legacy. Could you say a few words about this? Beyond what I said in the talk. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 I'd like Judith, perhaps, to, to join into this, since she's, she's, she's a, a member of my uh, department, uh, university's English department, and she may have another view on the matter. But, um, I mean, my, my view of, the, of, of literary scholarship, uh, but not just literary scholarship, I mean, I think the, the turn that Edward Said was involved in, this so-called post-colonial turn, we extended well beyond the, the field of, of literature and, and English scholars. It, was, it, was, it certainly influenced people in, in anthropology and a variety of other disciplines as well. And I think it was, it was on the whole, a healthy turn. Uh, I, I wrote an essay a long time ago in which I tried to puzzle out what was going on, and as Roger said, for, for many historians of, of his and my generation, uh, a lot of the language uh, that, was, that was being used was, was baffling, um, and, and that made it off-putting. There are ways, too, in which that, that, that literature uh, was, was, I think, insufficiently appreciative of the, the nuances and complexities of the historical experience. Having said that, I think the great virtue of, of, of the work of Said and others involved in this sort of post-colonial turn is that it pointed to, to the way in which we have to understand that, that, that power, the exertion of power, in this case imperial power, is not simply a matter of economic and political and military force, but is really a, a process of, of, of shaping the categories of debate, of, of determining sort of how one even speaks 
about subjects uh, such as the, the organization of particular societies, the relationship between different groups of people, uh, any number of other issues that, um, as, as to, to put it in cliched terms, that, that knowledge is power, that knowledge is power as well. And, and that, was, that was something that was, was, I think, a very useful message, in retrospect, perhaps now a, a bit of an obvious one, but uh, at the time not so obvious and very useful in sort of forcing particularly imperial historians such as myself to sort of reconsider sort of how we approached our subjects. Um, now, I had already sort of, I was, as, as Christian said, I, I got my degree at Berkeley and, you know, Foucault was sort of in the background there. So I, I had already sort of been infected to some degree, I suppose. And, and I was particularly interested in the cultural experience of colonialism. So I had already made some move away from sort of some of the traditional approaches that were taken to imperial history. But there's no question in my mind that in, in the broad broad perspective, I mean, what Saeed uh, and, and others uh, achieved was, was helpful, I think. All right, let's open it up for your comments and questions. Please wait for the microphone. We'll start over here. My name is uh, Stephen Shore. There are two classic themes that you've not really touched on. One was the conflict between going for the gold and going for God, the religious impulse in colonization. Mm -hmm. And the other was the vast expanse of slavery, which of course existed before 1492, but nowhere near the numbers and vast trade that it expanded to by in over the next hundred years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I didn't because I'm, I, I'm not so concerned with, with speaking about sort of European colonialism or imperialism generally, but more specifically about the enterprise of exploration. Um, now, explorers are driven, obviously, by a variety of motives. And, and if you look at, at, at Columbus, to, to start sort of at the beginning with the European enterprise, and, and uh, what's, what's going on there, I mean, it's, it's a mix of these considerations. Clearly, the primary motive for, for, for uh, Columbus and his sponsors is to find his way to the east and to increase trade. It's an economic enterprise. And he's very much preoccupied with, you know, sort of go, a goal. You read his journal accounts, you know, it's constantly, oh, the Indians told us there's gold here, there's gold there, this kind of stuff. But by the same token, he's a very religious man, and he frames his experiences within, uh, in what some historians have argued is an almost medieval sort of religious conceptual universe. Uh, and, and one can't neglect that. And then subsequently, of course, the, with, with the introduction of, of, of missionaries into, uh, into Latin America, that becomes even more pronounced. So I, you know, I think there clearly are a variety of, of, of motives at work um, that uh, uh, play on European imperial expansion more broadly and also certainly influence the, the interests of, of these explorers. Now, the question of, of slavery is, I mean, yeah, I mean, again, if we go back to Columbus, I mean, that, that's, that's part of the, the commercial enterprise. I mean, he collects a lot of, of Indians and ships them back to the, the old world and sells them as slaves. So that starts right at the, at, at the beginning. Now, by the, by the 18th century, and particularly by the 19th century, that, that factor, obviously, among European explorers is, is much diminished. And if you look at British explorers, say, in, in Africa in the 19th century, the rhetoric is always anti-slavery. I mean, it's, it's intensely uh, opposed to slavery, in part because, you know, by, by uh, 1807, the British have abolished uh, the slave trade and tried to stop other European countries from engaging in it. By 1833, they've, they've eliminated slavery as an institution in their, their, their possessions. And so it puts them sort of on the moral high ground, in contrast to where they were in the 18th century. And, and that rhetoric then, of sort of uh, ending slavery actually becomes one of the rationales for, for British entry into, into Africa. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Thank you. Uh, Don, open to you. Yeah, it's, I'm Don Wolfensberger. Uh, Earlier in your talk, you uh, mentioned sort of the linkage between exploration and what you called European exceptionalism, which is a term we don't hear much. But in, in me, it, uh, it brought forth sort of echoes of Frederick Jackson Turner here with his mm. frontier theory of American history and character and how the expanding frontier was really the driver of American exceptionalism, the inquisitiveness, the curiosity, the innovation, and so on, and how the 
closing frontier in 1892, we were going to sort of lose all that. And of course, he was later discredited when we turned out to be a pretty innovative people the next century. But and, and I thought, too, of, of Kennedy invoking the new frontier, sort of looking back at Frederick Jackson and Turner, talking about the new frontiers of space and the Peace Corps going into foreign lands and things of that nature. But I was wondering whether you see any parallels between the two. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I well, the United States is a, is a, is a European-derived society in terms of its its organization and cultural structures and the like. And and there's no question that. Um, what what Jackson describes as an American course of American exceptionalism is is part and parcel of this larger European exceptionalism. That's uh, arguments that are, that are made. I, I think they're hand in glove with one another. I mean, one looks at the first great American expedition that takes place right at the beginning of the 19th century, Lewis and Clark. Um, it's it's uh, it's organized along exactly these, these same lines, has, has many of the same scientific uh, pr principles, but is also a state-driven enterprise, has, has an imperial agenda, is looking for natural resources. I mean, all, all of the characteristics that I would describe as a feature of sort of broad, and in this respect, when I say European, I actually, I would include America as, as part of that Euro-American. Well, uh, two comments, one, I would caution you about decrees of abolition of slavery and actual abolition of slavery. Sure, sure. In the British Empire, I think in many areas it persisted into the late 19th century. The French repackaged it as uh, ransoming of hostages until 1910. Uh, Francois Renaud talks about this in his Russia à temps. Um, but uh, um, the, my main point is I'm, there's a, some wonderful studies about the formative uh, impact of exploration on the disciplines of the history of religions. David Chittister's written on this, and of course anthropology is rather obvious. But I'm curious how, why you would, would, whether you'd agree with me and why, why you think it would be the case that these exploration accounts have had relatively little impact on the discipline of history. And I'm curious to what extent the myth of peoples without history that uh, Mugimbe talks about as existing since the time of Herodotus and continuing certainly up to Hegel and you, Trevor Roper, mm -hmm. uh, uh, how that contributes to that, that persistent uh, quarantine of the exploration accounts from the discipline of history in, in terms of how it shaped the field. Yeah, I, I, I would actually argue the reverse in a sense, that, that I, my sense of this, I mean, is, is that academic historians basically began to lose interest in exploration as a subject um, around the time of decolonization, and that it was that it was driven by several several factors. Um, the previous generation of historians who wrote about exploration portrayed it basically in these triumphalist terms as that first stage in the process by which Europe remakes the world, <coughs> the colonial process. That seems to be discredited with the process of decolonization. Uh, and that triumphalist narrative simply collapses, I think. And by the same token, or it certainly is diminished, it doesn't collapse, it's, it still exists in various ways. Uh, by the same token, many of those uh, new historians who were interested in those parts of the world that became the objects of exploration becomes er become area study specialists. And, and their interest lies in those indigenous societies, how they developed over, over time. There was, in fact, um, my, I know among African historians in particular in the 60s and the 70s, almost a concerted effort to downplay the role of colonialism itself as a, as a force in, in the historical experiences of those peoples. And by the same token, exploration was a subject that simply had no value in the pursuits that they were engaged in. Now, this doesn't mean that they didn't make use of the resources or the material that explorers had produced. Many of them, in fact, drew upon those narratives and so on to, 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 for evidence, for, for their own understanding of these, these societies. But, but they had a very different agenda. And, and as a result, I mean, it was the combination, I think, of the collapse of decolonization, the turn towards area studies, um, and for that matter, I suppose, the, um, the way in which the United States, which, which had a, a somewhat different uh, approach 
toward uh, the, this, this global enterprise uh, became a dominant force in, in affairs that, that, that led to this diminishment of, of exploration as a subject. And it didn't die away by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, plenty of people were writing about exploration throughout these years, but, but it became basically the topic for, for popular historians and, and for biographers and, um, and, and not people in, in, you know, in the academy. But I'd be interested if you have, as an Africanist, whether you... Well, hold on, just the microphone. I'm, I'm questioning how, obviously, exploration and, and colonial empires and decolonization contributed to the, the rise of area studies in African history, but I'm curious about our relative lack of impact on the profession at its core, which it remains dominated by the European and American experience. That the, mm. the, the uh, so the, I, was, I was, in r religious studies, the theory that governs religious studies is, is derived almost exclusively from mm. indigenous people. And of course, anthropology, uh, in part of its contrast with sociology, has mm -hmm. a similar phenomenon. Mm -hmm. We don't have a similar phenomenon in history in terms of the way that we study change over time that is derived from the West's encounter with other people in the same way as we would in the history of religions or, mm. or religious studies I, or, or anthropology. So that was my, my see, question. Not okay. Obviously, there's the rise of area studies. I wouldn't yeah. be sitting here. Right, right. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. I just, uh, this is a very poorly formulated question because I'm not quite sure uh, how I'm going to ask this, but it, it has to do with, um, with your use of the term European exceptionalism and so forth. And I'm just curious to know um, how that fits in with the exploration of other peoples. Yeah. Um, I mean, the Chinese um, right. and, and so forth. That do we know enough to say that uh, the Europeans are really exceptional in this regard? Right. No, that's it, it's, it's a great question. And, 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 um, not being a, a historian of China, I'm, I'm hesitant to, to, to make those claims. But I mean, long ago, uh, Joseph uh, Nian or Nian? That, yeah, um, you know, sort of Needham, that's right, uh, you know, demonstrated that, that a lot of what Europeans thought was the distinct, were the distinctive attributes of Europe European science actually had many of their origins in, in, in China. I wouldn't be at all surprised if, if similar sorts of, of claims can be made uh, about China as a, as a society engaged in exploration. I know there's a, a wonderful book about, uh, about, about the Chinese in Central Asia, which demonstrate that they're doing some of the same kind of mapping practices and the like that, that, that Europeans were engaged in. Um, so, so I don't, I don't want to overdraw um, the, the difference. And, and I think that this is an area where a lot of work needs to be done, and, and I hope that it is done. It isn't something that I'm qualified to do. Uh, and it isn't something that uh, uh, I'm aware has has received nearly as much attention in in, in recent years as as the uh, the work or to to sort of reassess European exploration. But but I think I think you're right that that uh, one may well find. And there's also a very good book on the the Ottoman age of exploration, which makes a very similar kind of claim. One may well find that that a lot of what uh, historians saw is exceptional about the European experience was not exceptional at all. Yeah. This actually leads into the questions I had, and one of them is, um, is it useful to make a distinction between discovery and exploration? In other words, mm. there's a context where you can say the voyages of discovery are to go into the unknown, to find what you have not known before, yeah. et cetera, to use a cliche. Yeah. But exploration could be to find out how to exploit precisely what has been discovered. Yeah. You know, there, there, there are very different motives. And uh, I was wondering if you could comment on that. And the other thing, and this was just brought up by um, the previous uh, question, is we're looking at modernity in terms of our modernity today. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But can we find out any examples of which would have to go back into more non-Western areas, perhaps, at the, that at that time these people saw themselves as, as as modern and expanding their notion of, of modernity uh, and grasping and, and, and learning things that would help them in terms of how at some point. Yeah, yeah. Well, ju on, on the second point first, I mean, I, I think there's no, no question about it. But there's a, to, to add to, to the point I made about the contribution in some sense that, that post-colonial studies have made to, to sort of our rethinking of these issues, there's a wonderful book by Depeche Chakrabarty called uh, uh, 
provincializing Europe, in which he makes precisely this, uh, this point that, that our categories of thinking for thinking about modernity are so framed within a European historical context that we, we, we have a hard time sort of moving outside that and appreciating the way in which other societies saw modernity in different ways and, 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 and were engaged in, in modernity in, in, in their own terms. And, and I think that's, that's clearly the case. Um, the semantic issue, discovery versus exploration. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't talk, well, I suppose I probably used the, the word discovery in sort of an offhanded way. Um, what, what I was trying to, what, what I would simply do, and I, rather than sort of draw a distinction between the two, is insist upon the way in which exploration is a practice that comes to acquire a certain set of requirements attached to it, particularly by the 18th century, that sets it apart from other forms of, of travel. Now, sometimes that leads to discovery. Sometimes exploration doesn't lead to discovery at all, right? I mean, they don't find anything new. So, so they, the two are not coterminous, they're, and they're not synonymous by any stretch of the imagination. So you made some discreet, um, very chaste references to wine, women, and song. So you can just guess what my question is going to be <laughs> about women and gender. So, um, I mean, most yeah. of the explorers were male. Right. Uh, the few women explorers, the Gertrude Bells, were recoded as, as men, actually. Uh, she's like a man. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess my big question is, as you and I know, um, in the 19th century, there's a, a redefinition of masculinities and femininities mm -hmm. in Europe and other parts of the globe. So how does this exploratory model that you're proposing, how would that fit into a sort of bigger, more comparative gender history? Mm -hmm. A, a broader uh, comparative gender history. I don't know if I can answer that question. Uh, I, l let, let me give you my... What about masculinity? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, which, 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 which I can address, yes. Um, exploration as it comes to be construed culturally by Europeans in, by the 18th century, and in some sense, arguably, you know, from, from the 15th century, is innately a, or seen innately as a masculine enterprise. And part of the appeal of, and, and one has, this is another way in which one has to sort of place the, the way in which exploration is perceived and recoded uh, as it is produced for European audiences, for European readers. That issue of mascul masculinity really comes to the fore in dramatic ways. So that's, for example, when I when I, I, I talked about how many of these explorers actually feel helpless uh, in, on on these expeditions. That that's not what a, a man's supposed to feel like, right? And and that's not something that they can confess in in, in public. Um, so so masculinity is is a very important dimension of how exploration is culturally constructed uh, within European society. It also means, for example, it's very interesting if you look, like, uh, look, at, look at someone like, like Mary Kingsley. She insists she's not really an explorer. She's certainly not a scientific geographical explorer, even though she's, you know, she's collecting fish and she's doing all these kinds of things. No, no, no. no. She, 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 in fact, uh, sort of doesn't embrace that masculine category and, 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 and defines herself as simply a traveler. Now that, that those categories begin to break down by the the, the uh, I think the early 20th century, um, as as we have a, a lot more women travelers who actually begin to insist that they're not just travelers but they are, are are explorers themselves, and you have this great struggle, for example, in the Royal Geographical Society over whether women can be members of that society, and a great battle takes place, and eventually, I, I mean, in the early 20th century, they say no, but eventually they sort of back down on that. So, so yeah, gender, masculinity are integral dimensions of this whole sort of cultural construction of, of exploration as a, as a distinctively European enterprise. Now, what it's like in other societies? Yeah, I don't know. Jim Sang, you're talking about some of the earliest examples of sponsored research. <laughs> and yes, yes. Um, I'm curious. <laughs> Uh, it's these 
botanists and, geolog and ge geologists and zoologists who went out, did they have either explicitly or implicitly a requirement to publish? And did they have to publish within such and such time as coming back? <laughs> and five, five years later, did they have a project manager <laughs> saying, when, are you gonna, when is the book coming out? And also, were they expected to publish in a particular journal or particular proceedings or something? Uh, no, there wasn't publish and perish in quite the same way that there is today. Um, look, I, th this kind of scientific enterprise is, is very hierarchical, and one of the things that's quite interesting to, to observe is, is, is how these, these boundaries and definitions of professional um, expertise are, are constructed and created. So what you often find is that those people who take part in these expeditions um, are collecting a lot of this material, and sometimes they may publish, you know, stuff um, in, in, in journals, but for the most part, the expectation is that they're going to hand over what they've collected to, you know, Kew Gardens, to the Natural History Museum, to a variety of these other institutions where embedded experts within those institutions then examine, assess, the, the, the value of, of this information, compare it against other information they have, and they're the ones that are mainly doing the publication work. Okay. And there's also, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a kind of interesting, I mean, you have all these collectors that are wandering around the empire, sort of gathering, you know, uh, all kinds of, 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 uh, of specimens, uh, and who, who make a decent living out of it, but they make a decent living by than selling that material to, to these, these metropolitan institutions, where, where it's then analyzed. Is there a mandatory requirement by authorization? Well, there, there, there's certainly, it's certainly desirable. And so, Mic microphone, hmm? otherwise. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sorry. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, could I return for a moment to the question of power and Edward Said? Yeah. Um, I think this is maybe more of a comment that I'd be interested to know how you respond to it. In a sense, what Said did was restore or maintain the triumphalist view of European imperialism <coughs> by arguing that the power was cultural and, um, and uh, that empire was a hegemony. So, uh, but one of the interesting things that the, that your work and other work seems to me to suggest is in fact the way in which that is undermined by uh, the bringing to the fore of the, uh, of the fragility of it all. I mean, implicit, not just at the moment of decolonization, but from the very beginning, mm -hmm. uh, the fragility uh, of empire. In your case, uh, the way in which explorers, in fact, uh, are so dependent upon uh, indigenous people's roots and customs and expertise, something that, that was always sort of only hinted at in the, mm -hmm. uh, in the, uh, in the uh, traditional literature, but which um, you know, clearly uh, uh, was, was at, the, at the heart of what they were doing. Mm -hmm. So um, it seems to me that one of the logics of, of, of your argument here is to, in a sense, fracture, to deconstruct, to decompose the notion of empire as power, mm -hmm. but the notion of empire as something that is European power. Mm -hmm. It's as much indigenous power <laughs> mm -hmm. as it is mm -hmm. European power, mm -hmm. um, both in these terms and, of course, in terms of when you ask the question, who ran the empire, mm -hmm. empires? Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, that complicates the notion of power a great deal, the notion of imperial power. I Yes, Richard, I, <laughs> I, I, I agree, but I would qualify it. I, I, I think we should never lose sight of the fact that, that empire <coughs> is about power and that somebody has it and someone else doesn't. And, and, and while it's important, I think, to, 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 to uh, provide a kind of nuanced understanding of how it operates on the ground and the way in which various parties are beneficiaries of it, um, it's, it's the Europeans who are the, who are the primary beneficiaries. I would, I would sort of pull back, actually, and, and, and make a more qualified claim, which is that um, this period of exploration, where you have these small numbers of Europeans who are entering into these territories uh, and, and are largely helpless, 
I, I guess part of my point would be, although they, they serve as avatars of empire, they sort of lay the groundwork for empire, um, on a certain level, they're not really imperialists themselves because they don't have power. Now, that, empower, that power does come, but it comes with, with conquest and it comes with colonization. And uh, it, it, it still certainly has some limitations. But, but I think it's a completely different story in many respects from, from what's occurring uh, to, these, to these explorers. I mean, this is, this is, this is a, a precursor, if you will. But, uh, but the explorers are, in some cases, laying the basis for collaboration which is the oh, essential oh, ab part oh, absolutely. of the absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dane, could you tell us a little about the development of the field of uh, historical geography? In other words, how have the geographers themselves responded to these uh, developments as a discipline? Well, I mean, some of, the, some of the best work I've come across has come from historical geographers. I mean, they, they are writing some really, really interesting stuff. Um, and, um, and, and, and it's, it, it comes, as I tried to suggest, I think it comes originally from the way in which they were obliged to confront the origins of their own discipline and uh, what that meant in terms of, of certain um, assumptions that underlay traditional sort of structures of, of that discipline. Uh, that, that led them to sort of examine in very, very careful and, 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 and nuanced way, give, give a kind of critical examination of, of, you know, how geography as a discipline comes into being and how closely connected it is uh, with exploration and, and with empire, definitely with empire as well. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? I was doing a comparative analysis of exploration and then, um, but particularly of course with reference to the Ottoman Mediterranean uh -huh. lands, uh, very adjacent and, and uh, familiar. Uh -huh. And it, can we say generally speaking that explor exploration in Ottoman lands from the 18th or 19th century on really is archaeology more than botany? Yeah. Yeah. And why is that so? I mean I think we have to think about why is the Ottoman Empire and adjacent Mediterranean, you know, the, the southern and eastern ends of the Mediterranean basin. Why would that be a, a very different kind of exploration? Of course, the Ottoman Mediterraneans aren't European anyway. Yeah, hold on to that. So tell us. <laughs> you're, you're the specialist. <laughs> I mean, a lot of the Europeans are not Europeans, or, or they're, you know, national identity and origins are highly yeah. contested, like the yeah. British Consul of Tunis was really from a dragoman family born in Constantinople. Yeah. So his yeah. name is Richard Wood, but you know. <laughs> but so a lot of these folks floating around the Mediterranean are, are you know, are border crossers in yeah. many senses of the term. And, and what it, I don't really know if calling them European is helpful or it covers up, maybe it, it occludes as much, much as it um, reveals to us. Well, y y th that's interesting. I, I mean, I don't, I don't look at the, at the Mediterranean, but, but one of the things I do look at is uh, exploration in West Africa, where um, they, they determined fairly early on, you know, it, it, there are these efforts by Mungo Park and others to sort of enter West Africa from, from the coast, and they're generally disasters. And, and then they try the, 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 the Trans-Saharan route from, from Tripoli, and there they have a bit more quite a bit more success. But what's interesting, and, and also from, from, from Cairo. But what's interesting here is that the, the, the guys who lead these expeditions, I mean, they're, they're either British naval or military officers, or they're Germans who've, who've, who've studied with Blumenthal and who, who uh, have, have been recruited to, to take part in, in this enterprise. So, so Heinrich Parth is a good example of that. Most of these guys have intermediaries as well who are going with them. But a lot of these intermediaries are exactly the kind of people you're talking about. Many of them are people who, who, who basically almost become sort of deracinated, who, 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 were, who oftentimes were, say, European soldiers who became captured by the Ottoman Empire or who were shipwrecked in, in, you know, along the coast somewhere and who you know, learned Arabic, often converted to Islam, and had this, this interesting marginal position, which makes them ideal intermedi intermediaries in this enterprise. Are they European? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know. But, 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 
I, I, th I think they're, they're people whose, whose cultural position is actually quite, quite hybrid and, 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 and complicated. But they're not usually the ones who are leading expeditions. They're serving actually as intermediaries in the same way that many indigenous Africans and Aborigines do in, in Australia and, and, and elsewhere in other, well, I butchered that sentence. In the same way that black Africans do in much of the rest of sub-Saharan Africa in expeditions there and the way that many Aborigines do in explorations in Australia. So you, there too, you often find that the people who are serving as intermediaries are people who've already sort of managed to sort of move between cultures. So in West Africa, a lot of these people are, are ex-slaves who've uh, recaptives who've, who've been deposited in Sierra Leone. And you know, an expedition will come by, stop in Sierra Leone, say, hey, anybody know how's it here? Come along with us. And, and then some of these guys become quasi-professionals in their own right. Or in East Africa, a very famous case is, is the case of Sidi Mubarak Bombay. This is a guy who, who was enslaved as a child, sent off to India, and, and then was freed once his master died and made his way back to, to East Africa where, where he served uh, with the, uh, the Sultan of Zanzibar's military force met up with Burton and speak, and they said, hey, we need somebody. He couldn't speak English, but he could, he could speak Hindi or Hindustani. And so he could, he could communicate uh, with, with Burton and speak, and at the same time, he, he, he knew, he knew uh, um, Swahili and uh, served as, as a useful translator and became absolutely essential to, whole, essential to a whole series of expeditions. I mean, this guy is really remarkable. And there are plenty of others like him. Now, most of them, you know, their, their stories are hard to extract from, from the evidence, but, but you start looking at these expeditions, they pop up time and time again. You know. <laughs> no, no, sure. Thank you. Any other questions? Then when I'm going to get into the elevator uh, to leave the building later on, and I happen to run into, we'll get on the elevator with uh, one of... Uh, one of the, the, the members of the leadership at the center there, and I'm, they're going to ask me what I did today. I'm going to tell them I chaired a, a, a talk on exploration, and the question is going to be, what's, what's the policy lesson? What's the meaning <laughs> of this for today? Um, you hinted, actually, you hinted at some of this uh, um, in your talk, but I wonder if you can just um, uh, explicate it just a little more in terms <laughs> of the, the policy relevance, the, uh, the, the relevance for today of... Um, your, um, your talk here on exploration. Damn, I was afraid someone was going to ask a question like that. <laughs> <laughs> Great question. I, 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 I knew it had to happen in, in the Wilson Center. Um, you know, obviously, like most historians, I'm not comfortable, for the most part, in, in, in considering policy implications of the kind of work that I do, and particularly given that this is work that concerns, um, for the <coughs> most part, uh, you know, at, the most uh, 100 years ago and, and, and further back, it's, it's often difficult to do so. But I guess I did try to allude to, to some, if not policy implications, at least contemporary relevance of, of these issues. And, and I, I think their relevance lies in the way in which um, exploration, that the, the enterprise itself and our examination of it does give us, I think, a richer, more nuanced appreciation of how globalization begins and how cultures come into contact with one another and what the dynamics of those interactions are at, you know, in these first contacts, which I, I think sort of sets the stage in many respects for, for, for much of what uh, follows on. I, th I think that it, as I tried to allude at the end, that it has some relevance because many of these these, these first travelers are, are taking such meticulous records, not just of indigenous societies and so on, but of, the in, of, of, of these environments and the natural features of these environments and what they observe about these environments, um, I think can, can be useful to us in, in understanding how, how, how our natural environment is, is changing and, and has, has altered in the past. And that's one area where, where sort of archeology span as exploration actually has some, some real importance, not just in the Mediter Mediterranean, but in Central Asia and South America and elsewhere, too. Uh, so, 
say that one of the policy connections would be that indigenous knowledge and indigenous frames of reference would are relevant to understand. I mean, mm. let's say to World Bank or whatever to go and work in uh, India or Africa. I think that's been recognized, but not. So your work will help them to <laughs> sort of see it in clearer terms. Well, uh, Sudhir, I, 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 I hope. I s actually sort of hope they already got that lesson. But <laughs> <laughs> well, there is one major policy issue here that does come out of this. Um, we should have members of Congress uh, visiting uh, other places in the world without flying first class and without staying in luxury <laughs> hotels, and they should go out in the countryside yeah. uh, yeah. and spend a month yeah. uh, rather than two days <laughs> uh, and see what they learn. Thank you. And thank you for an absolutely fascinating talk um, this afternoon. I th it was a great seminar. I learned a lot. I hope all of you did. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I invite you to continue the conversation more informally over uh, some, some uh, nibbles outside. Uh, let's give a round of applause to Dan Kennedy. Thank you.